Okay, so again, I'm Dan Kabisky, co-chair of the international community. We're so happy to see such a great crowd here uh, today. Uh, officially, we were going to have to turn, turn away about 15 or 20 people. But th I think this is a good, you know, doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, with us today are two really, really excellent speakers who are going to talk about the issue of uh, threats to journalists in Mexico and why it matters. And remember the second part of that question, why it matters. Uh, immediately next to me here is Catherine Corcoran, who was the AP Bureau Chief in Mexico City. She covered all of Latin America, and for transparency's sake, she interviewed my wife a few times when my wife was ambassador in to Honduras. So, no bad feelings. <laughs> Uh, over here is Christina Caicedo. Yes, Caicedo Smith. Uh, Smith. Uh, she is a Voice of America correspondent and producer. This uh, is from the Voice of America Press Freedom page. It's on risks and rewards. Uh, both of them have worked extensively in Mexico, have a lot of experience. Oh, and I'm sorry, one last thing about. Catherine, her book is available now, the, uh, In the Mouth of the Wolf. And she will be available after this session to sell you copies and to autograph them for you. And it will be in the uh, registration room right across from the registration table. Always plug an author. Thank you. <laughs> Especially if the author is sitting next to me. <laughs> All right, um, again. This is a conversation, so as we go along, if you have questions, we would like to hear them at the time the question comes to your mind instead of waiting. Uh, we're going to be talking about the threats to journalists in Mexico, but there's much, much more to it than just simple threats. Simple. Uh, Vicente Calderon, who we were hoping would be able to join us uh, today, is the founder and editor of Tijuana Press. And he told the international community recently that the threats to journalists in the US and Mexico threaten society. And this is what we're going to be looking at. He noted that while Mexico is the most dangerous place for journalists in the world, and that includes war zones, that more threats are coming in the United States as well. We had the case of the journalist in Las Vegas who was stabbed by a disgruntled government official. We had the January 6th insurrectionists and their supporters who keep talking about hanging journalists. What Vicente said was these actions destabilize democratic societies. They destabilize local communities. And so I think what I'd like to start with, if, uh, from, from the two of you, if you, uh, if you would, this actually works. <laughs> we, were, we were first told no microphones. Um, I, I would like you to work off of Vicente's comments about the destabilizing impact threats to journalism have, uh, the, the, the destabilizing impact on societies. Uh, Catherine, you can go first. Okay. Well, that became one of the main reasons that I wrote my book. My book is the story of a journalist who was assassinated in the Mexican state of Veracruz in 2012, so 10 years ago. And the story is about what happens to a society when you silence the press. And in this case, the citizens became preyed upon by their own government officials. And there was no independent voice, no um, reported or journalistic voice to tell the, citi the citizens or the society what was going on. So they were basically operating in the darkness while this criminal government preyed on its own citizens. And as I was writing this book, I started to hear the same rhetoric in, that I heard in Mexico reporting this story in the United States. And that is the press is corrupt. The press lies. The press is the enemy. And if, if 
if an official or a government is successful in selling that, that narrative to the people and you don't know what to believe, you become very easily manipulated by them. And it's something that's pretty much authoritarianism 101, that anyone who agrees with the agenda is good, agrees with the regime. Anyone who agrees with the regime is good. Anyone against the regime is corrupt, lying enemy. And so to hear that kind of rhetoric in the United States, for the first time, I've been a journalist for decades, had never heard any, anyone speak like that before. And it really has taken off. It's, it's a, a very effective strategy there and here and in a lot of parts of the world. And so to hear that in my own country, I often say was the most startling thing to me about writing this book. Because I was investigating this phenomenon in, my, in another country, and then I started to see the very beginnings of it in the United States. And as Dan mentioned, there are now a lot of attacks on journalists in the United States. They started tracking them in 2017 through something called Free, um, Freedom Tracker. And before 2017, there was no count of attacks on journalists in the United States because it wasn't necessary. And again, I said, you know, for decades, I was a journalist and I never worried about being the target of someone on a story by identifying myself as a journalist. And now in the United States, journalists have to think about that all the time, that they may become the target just for being the journalist, just for being the messenger. And so I think the point that I want to get across in writing this book and just in general is, is this the kind of society we want to live in? Is this... The, the, we're nowhere near the situation in Mexico. I don't want to, you know, I want to make that very clear. But the erosion is beginning. And is this where we want to go? My book is about if you let that road go, it leads to what you see in the book. But if, do we really want to go down that road? And that's where we are right now. And that's what we need to ask ourselves. Because when you hit a journalist, the journalist is not the ultimate target. The journalist is the first line of attack, the messenger. The target is the society. Christine, have you talk about some of your reporting and what you've seen as well, please? Yes, and I think, Catherine, you end the sentence perfectly. Um, because when we did uh, Risk and Reward and we did another story about the mechanism in two different parts of Mexico, um, what I saw through the reporter, reporting and talking to reporters was that they have to continue working and doing what they do because if they don't report on those important issues, the community not only it's without information, they start making decisions uh, based on things they see on the internet, uh, messages they can get on WhatsApp. So th they they strike they start. Um, making decisions that it, it can also be dangerous for for the society or this community they're working on. Uh, for the risk and reward specifically is the pursuit of reporters there in Tijuana, the daily work, um, you know, kind of like a, we can say it's kind of like a battle when, when they have to go and ask questions, you know, governors, uh, mayors they don't want to hear um, because if they don't do that work, they know their community is not going to be informed. So many times that I, um, while I was in Tijuana and I was asking Vicente, which I, I met there, and he was there with me through the week, and he was, he was telling me if, if we don't go ahead and, and say, just as an example, uh, there's an issue in this bridge, it's going to is having this type of problems, if we don't go and report on that story, People are going to go through that bridge. They're going to keep doing it, and and I think it was very impressive to me knowing that um, even though sometimes they don't have the information, authorities don't have the information because you know local community uh, people they don't trust the police or they don't trust the authorities, and they trust a reporter who has who lives in the same community who may have the same issues, so. Their, you know, reporters are their voice. So I think it was very interesting to, to notice that, um, how, reporters and journalism can also impact the society in the sense of, if they're not there, no one is gonna, 
tell about what's going on. Did you want to add uh, tech out again? Or? Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, Christine, I'd like to, to, to just stay with you for just a, uh, a second here. I'd like you to, to carry on with that idea of what of the community trusting the press, or at least listening to the press. Maybe we're not 100% in the trustworthy phase yet. Uh, your piece on um, uh, risk and reward, and how, um, what, why, you know, there, there are all these risks. I mean, you know, we had talked about uh, in other times of here's a reporter going grocery shopping, and right there in the produce section is the very guy who put a gun to her head, you know, just the other day and said, "Stop reporting on this stuff." Yeah. How, what, how, and why do reporters keep doing this with these kind of of, of threats? Well, for the mechanism, it was interesting when we um, interviewed the main reporter of the story, he, he kind of talked to you about it like something common, like, oh, you know, I just went to the grocery store and I just bought this, and I also met the guy or, you know, saw the guy who kidnapped me a couple of weeks back. So I was like, that's not normal. <laughs> like, like, I, I imagine, like, I'm thinking that's not normal. So. Just to talk a little bit about that experience, um, usually crime reporters, state reporters in, in, um, in Mexico, in this side of the border, that's Reyn in Reynosa, on, the, on that side of the border, um, they, usually they're targeted. And sometimes it's not even because you're continuously reporting about local government uh, mis, you know, misuse of funds, it's just because you're in the wrong place at the wrong time. So he, he was going on his, um, he was noticed, uh, notified that he, there was a, a, a murder in this area who is protected by this type of you know, criminal gang. So he went without knowing because usually in WhatsApp reporters, they talk to each other and it's like, don't go there because this, is, you know, this gang specifically doesn't want anyone there. He didn't saw his phone. And when he went there and took the photos and did the reporting, he was kidnapped. In Mexico, it's called levantado. So they kind of, you know, kidnap you for a couple of hours, drive you around, hit you, and then they drop. Sometimes people get killed. Sometimes they, you know, thankfully get back home. And for him, uh, a couple of weeks later, he, he, at the end, the the guy who kidnapped him talked to the police officer or the you know the director of the police in Reynosa. They're like, oh, you know, you know Juan? Oh, yes, I know him. Like, why do you have him? Why did, why did you, you know, kidnap him? And he gets off this way, um, you know, saved by authorities talking to, to criminal organizations as well. So, and when he gets back and he kind of like goes back into daily life with his family, um, he lost his iPad. And on his way to the grocery store, when he had his two kids, small kids, in the car with him, he found, you know, he was like, oh, hi, hello. <laughs> oh, and the, and the guy, and it was funny to me because he talks with this naturality of this is something that happens very often there. Um, and I asked him, why do you keep doing this if it's something that is in danger in your life? And, and, and the mechanism, which is the system that I'm not going to go that much further, but the system that usually it's in charge of protecting or you know writing down the cases of journalists and reporters who who are you know being threatened or who have been kidnapped or you know something a little bit more dangerous has happened to them, so they can go to the system and um, report on those issues. Um, he he found himself. Um, in, in a dangerous situation, which he said, like, okay, if I, if I go into the system, maybe they're going to move me to Mexico City. So I'm going to stop reporting in my town, which I've been living for many years. And then where is going to be my income if I first, like, how I'm going to live if I, I'm a Reynosa reporter, not a Mexico City reporter? And second, I'm going to leave a community without information because I'm one of the few reporters who actually do that type of story of you know, crime, the crime story, the, the Nota Roja, those type of things. So they kind of know the importance of them being there because not many people do that. Mm -hmm. so. it, 
we, I know we have one question here, but uh, Catherine, uh, you've covered not just Mexico, but you've covered all of Central America, and there are numerous threats against journalists in uh, Central America as well. Could you just talk a little bit about why do these journalists in Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador keep doing what they do despite the threats also? Well, I would say that um, I've talked more to Mexican journalists about that because, because of the book. And the thing that's very interesting is they have the same calling that journalists do. We really, pe people don't believe this or maybe think it's corny, but it's really true. We do what we do because we feel like it is important to the society and it is important to the maintenance of a free society. And so a lot of the reporters I talk to and who are, are featured in the book, they, are, they lived under an authoritarian regime and they saw the system open up into a democracy, a very imperfect one, but a democracy. And they felt, they do feel that the press is very important in helping that system flourish. And so there is a, a real ideological component to it and even though there's a lot of corruption and they can write a huge investigation about somebody and nothing happens really because of the impunity there, they say it's still important for the public to have this information. And someday some things will change if we keep doing it. If, if they stop doing it, there's, no, there's a guarantee that nothing will change. And so they keep doing it. They're, um, they're very brave. They're getting um, better and better about understanding security measures and, and protecting themselves more. And um, an interesting thing, I was recently at a conference a couple weeks ago in, in Mexico City, and the reporters now are talking about creating their own system to help other reporters under threat. Um, because as Christina mentioned, if you're a reporter under threat, the current system of protecting you is just terrible. It ruins your life. It uproots you. It takes away your job. And so, so the reporters are now saying that we want to create a system for the reporters of the threat or the reporters desplazados who have to be, basically have to be taken out of a community for their, you know, to save their own lives. And so they're there is a lot of um, development there that's, that's hopeful at this point, and you have reporters talking more about it openly, about the threat they're under, and what can we do about it to, to, to mitigate these threats. And they do talk about how, because, again, under the authoritarian system, they were harassed all the time. It wasn't like this, they weren't killed, but they, they for a while, they really normalized it. And they said, well, you know, oh, this guy sits outside my apartment every night and every morning. Yeah, it's normal. And I think they're, sta they're, not, they're starting to realize that, no, no, that's not normal. It can lead to these killings, because in the past it didn't. It was just harassment. And now a lot of reporters are ending up dead. So there is, um, I would say, much more mobilization now on the part of the, of the profession there than I have seen in the past. We have a question right here. So in, in Mexico, uh, journalists are usually bothered, they're usually covering narcos or politicians, and that's usually who ends up bothering them. Um, but in the U.S., who bothers the journalists here? What, who is trying to suppress them? I would say it's mostly in the political, in the uh, context of the political polarization that we are um, experiencing right now, where um, certain people will see the press as the enemy and so in some in a lot of cases now they're led by the political candidates or elected officials who are saying these kinds of things and it's not just one person anymore it's a lot of people and so they found that this is a, an effective way of of silencing critical coverage and i would say right now it's mostly in the political arena, but if you go to this Freedom Tracker, first of all, there have been 1,600, more than 1,600 attacks on journalists since 2017. <coughs> and the vast majority, more than 900, are physical attacks. The other kinds of attacks are subpoenas and harassment, but, but the vast majority are physical attacks. And so you can look at the reasons people are being attacked. Sometimes it's for 
um, covering a certain protest that some people don't want them to cover, or a certain event people don't want them to cover, or maybe a pipeline, or maybe a topic that whoever the powers that be are want, don't want to be um, exposed. But I would say most of the time it's, um, <coughs> it's at rallies, it's at events. But again, you really have to think now in a way I never had to think. If I go knock on someone's door and say I'm a reporter, how, how do, I have to think about how they're going to react. My, my co-chair, uh, when she, she was doing a story with the BBC, uh, she had to approach a uh, house that was a headquarters for a neo-Nazi group in Southern California, and nobody knew if she was going to be coming back alive. I mean, she still went to do the story, but you know, she was going there as part of this BBC documentary. And she just knew it was her job. Mike? Um, Catherine, I was a reporter in Mexico in the late 70s up until uh, through the 80s. Uh, I knew some of your predecessors, like Eloy Aguilar oh, yes. and people like that. Anyway, Mexican reporters were paid miserably, yeah. very, very poor salaries, and very, very subject to bribery, taking bribes to supplement their income, that sort of thing. Is that still going on? What's, what's it like today? I think it's improved dramatically. Um, I'd like to hear what you think, Christina. That was the system of reporting for decades under the pre, which was the yeah. one party rule, the authoritarian party. And so that was the way they kept the press under control. Is in most cases, they would pay them off. And I, because as you said, the salaries were so low, it was very easy. And the salaries continue to be very low, especially in the outlying states outside of Mexico City. And so yes, the reporters are very vulnerable to corruption for that reason. I would say though that there's, there's, a, there's been a movement, and especially among the younger reporters, where they come out of, of journalism school now and they're better trained, there's much more training for journalists now in Mexico than existed before. And they really have the desire to be a real reporter and to be a watchdog and to uh, speak truth to power and all of those kinds of things. Um, but because they have very little support, it makes it very difficult to do. They have little support money-wise, but also from often from their own media. The, the higher-up editors will quash stories and say, well, no, we're, we're not going to write that just because we don't want to have any trouble. Mm -hmm. But I would say, especially in Mexico City now, there are new media, mostly online, that are very independent, very aggressive, and there's better investigative reporting being done there, and more of it than ever. And it is of really high quality. So this is something that's new and growing inside of Mexico. And um, the people who do this kind of work and who can trust each other, that, that's another reason why the press is so vulnerable is because Within the press corps, people don't trust each other because they don't know who's being paid off. If you're a clean reporter, you don't know, you don't necessarily want to team up or talk to your colleague because you don't know if they're being paid off or you suspect that they are. And some of them are informants for the gov government. Some of them are informants for the narcos. That phenomenon definitely still exists. But I would say the good news is there's just there's been a, a tremendous increase in good journalism in Mexico in the recent years. It's good to hear it's getting better, little, little by little. What, what and Christine, I mean, you, you, work, yes. you worked with a lot of journalists in Mexico up and down the border and up and down the country. What's your? Yes, um, I think as Catherine, you were saying, it's very impressive to know how reporters, they, want, they, they understand the dangers of what they do and they want to become more independent because what happens is for example, in Tijuana, if you work for this news outlet specifically, the editor there is going to say, we're not going to run this story because it's going to get us in danger. So sometimes they prefer to start their own independent media, um, you know, working as a freelancer or, you know, starting to find their way of living by themselves because they want to pursue that story and tell that story. And I, and I found it not only in Tijuana and Reynosa as well, where you know, if the, if the main um, newspaper of the city is not going to run my story because it touches some, you know, sentiments between, and it can be dangerous for 
for that, you know, specifically that, that newspaper, they, they start working on this, um, you know, creating their own independent media. It's really impressive how many reporters have, you know, created their own, um, you know, websites, they do their own stories, very in-depth investigation. I think there's also very, or many organizations in Mexico who are interested on promoting that work as well. So sometimes they get together a group of reporters and they apply for grants so they can, you know, do this certain uh, investigation. Um, in Mexico City happens um, a lot and also in Tijuana where they just get support or economical support so they can start working on their stories and start, you know, reporting on very good in-depth in stories that you were saying, yeah. And the other thing they've done is they have, create, they have created websites that will print all of the stories that the traditional media won't print. So in addition to forming their own media, which is really hard, I mean, it's hard to keep a small uh, media, the news, online newspaper with five people and you have to pay them. It's very hard to, to do that and keep them going. But then there, um, there are networks are, are actually websites that will print these investigations separate of their news organizations. And usually yeah. they have two jobs as well. Like they well, like Vicente. Yeah, like I mean, Vicente. he runs a news service in, in Tijuana, yeah, but yet he, he's he, a freelancer. He, he has, you know, worked, I was told he was to make sure you were safe while yes, you were doing risk. He was, <laughs> yeah. 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 He was a very good uh, fixer. <laughs> yeah, we have so, I have a question. So, like you guys mentioned before, how some some ways that these reporters can remain safe is by communicating through the WhatsApp to tell each other like what regions not to go to. <coughs> but what other advice have you heard of for reporters to remain safe and as well as just getting their story through? Well, we I work with an organization called Quinto Elemental Lab. Do you know Quinto? Yeah. Um, Quinto and Elemental Lab is one of these organizations that you mentioned which gives grants to, for, for smaller media to do investigative projects. But we're in a project where we're actually training editors because one of the issues is that the reporters want to do the work but they don't get the backup from the editors. And so, and, and editors get very little, even less training than reporters in Mexico and not much here either in the United States. But anyway, so so we created this program to train editors to lead investigations. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to train the editors to say, you're the person who's in charge of security of your teams. Just like I was in charge of security of my teams at the Associated Press. And so somebody, because these reporters, like you said, they're going out on their own, they're relying on WhatsApp and other people, and they're completely out there in these very dangerous situ situations with no backup. And so what we're teaching the editors is to create a security protocol, to have monitoring, to do advanced reporting to understand the safety of whether you can go out to an area or not. And so, um, so one of the efforts going on is obviously to institutionalize security for these reporters, just like there are security systems for the international media that cover Mexico. Every, every single, the AP has it, the New York Times has it, everybody has it, but it was not a tradition in Mexico, and so now we're trying to make that part of the job. It's to evaluate security and keep your team safe. In, in the case of, um, for example, risk and reward in Tijuana, um, because Tijuana had two, you know, journalists killed at the beginning of the year. Usually, what um, some of the reporters describe to me, usually reporters are very competitive among each other, in the sense of like who gets, the, you know, who's first on, on the scene, who gets, you know, the first soundbite, you know, I'm gonna send this first. So, uh, uh, but based on what's been going on in Mexico and and the risk of reporting there, um, they. It started with this WhatsApp group that it was initially for something different, and then when they noticed that if we're not together in this, no one is going to protect us, no one is going to help us, or it's going to come too late. Um, it kind of it kind of worked a little bit with them because they're um, when they go to these places, and you know I'm going to go to just to give 
random name. I'm going to go to uh, Playa. You know, I'm going to go to Playa. So I'm going to do this this story. I'm on my way there. I'm going to share the location because I'm on my way there. Reporters keep track on them. And one of the cases that one of the editors from an independent media told me um, that he he went. He was like, I think someone is following me back. Like I think someone is. It's. I'm, I'm. I just left the place, and I and I think someone is following me back. They contact the police, and the police actually met with the reporter. So something did happen. You know, like even authorities are sometimes not as effective as they wish. It, they were in Mexico. They are noticing that reporters are aware of the dangers of being a reporter, and they're like, this is happening. Someone is being followed. Um, he may be in danger. Uh, so, uh, you know, police and, 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 and National Guard, Mexico National Guard actually goes there and, and try to see what's going on. So they're pushing, pushing, pushing so much that police and authorities are kind of like listening. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have to do this. But not because, um, if, and I think it's a, it's a consequence, a good consequence of them being together as a guild, like them being together. No. I'll just, just remind people what Clarissa, Clarissa Ward said today and when she was accepting her fellowship with the SPJ. We may be competitors, but we have each other's back when we're out in the field. Yeah. Um, and I think that's you know, exactly what you're describing here. Uh, yes, you have a behind you. you. Um, so talking about Mexico, kind of like a follow-up of what you said about the journalists trying to make their own like group to help each other through system. How can they actually do that in Mexico? Like according to the constitution in Mexico, uh, you have freedom of speech, freedom of press, but the government itself is against them. And I know that in Spain they're actually talking to the United Nations about it, that what's going on, pointing out what's going on in Mexico. But as reports in Mexico, how can they actually protect themselves? Like have they talked a little bit about more about what their system could be? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part. Are they are have they, they talked a little bit more about what their system could be to actually protect themselves inside the government that is becoming very like aggressive towards outsiders? I think um, they're coming up with things more organically. Again, this system where they're, the reporters now are talking about how can we create a system to help other reporters under threat and the ones who get taken out of their environment and sent to Mexico City. How can we get them work? How can we keep them being reporters or being journalists? Um, so there's, there are those efforts. But also, um, as Christina mentioned, they're making more noise. And they are going to the authorities. What was really fascinating and terrible to me when I first got to Mexico, that was in 2008, is when there were attacks on these uh, journalists or on media companies, they completely shut down. They completely went silent thinking that would be their protection by not talking about it. And oftentimes they would distance themselves from the reporter who was killed. They would say, well, they weren't a full-time, they were just a contractor. We, we didn't give them permission to write that story. We didn't know what they were working on. And there was a complete shutdown, which again, to me as an American journalist was, was counterintuitive because, it's, because you want to make noise. The problem is if there's no if there's impunity and no justice system to back you up, it is very dangerous to make noise. But I think since then um, they have learned to make noise. And for example, in this case where they had someone following and when they called the police because somebody was following this person. But um, also there was a case in Sinaloa, which is a state completely run by the Sinaloa cartel, and. Um, a photographer from one of the newspapers there, El Noroeste, was kidnapped. And what? And they, this newspaper has had so many attacks. They took shots at the editor. They steal their trucks so they can't deliver the newspaper. They've just been harassed over the years. So the editor is, is very well versed in handling these kinds of cases. And as soon as the reporter was kidnapped, he put out an all points bulletin to everybody and told everybody to just make as much noise as possible. And people went immediately in the streets and they demanded the return of this photographer safely. 
And the photographer was let go about 24 hours later. And this was the general public, not, not it was, report. It, it was the journalism community, but with the support of some of their, you know, their supporters. And that's a point that this, this editor makes a lot, Adrian Lopez, his name is, and he's a very forward thinker in, in Mexico. And he says, the way to save us is to get the public to support us, to get the public to demand that we be able to do our jobs with, safely. And so he, that he has done a lot of work at his newspaper on community building and actually having events for the community or writing things, writing more fun things for the community. Like um, he did a thing called Como Sabe Sinaloa and they did this huge thing on all the cuisine of Sinaloa. And, and so he's really worked on building that connection because when a, when a photographer gets kidnapped, he wants the public on the street demanding that that reporter come back. I'm not sure how much to, the, how, to that extent it happened in that case. I know it was like the journalism community that was out on the street, but, but he sees that as the way, without, without a government or a, a, a system, an institution to protect them, he says, we really need the public to protect us. Mike? I'm sorry, um, Robert. Um, I know that self-censorship has been a pretty serious problem among the Mexican media. And I'm wondering, has it, has it gotten any better with these security uh, elements that you've been talking about? Um, um, I think self-censorship is still an issue in Mexico with the reporters that I talked to. Um, I think also, uh, some of them understand that they have to release the information. Sometimes it's a matter of if the editor doesn't want you to, or the, the public, or you know, the newspaper doesn't want you to, to release that information specifically. But I think reporters in Mexico are becoming more bold. Like they're, they're just going forward with their information. Um, for them, sometimes when and going a little bit back to you know the mechanism, which is the government institution to protect journalists and and um, human rights activists. They even though you're in this protection system, it doesn't it doesn't replace um, what the government can do for you in the sense of like I go to the mechanism, um, I I try to you know present my case, they do write your case, you're in the file, but in your daily life, it's not, it's not working good enough. You can have escorts, you can have um, you know, people protecting you for a while, but then you know, it's been a month to month and you don't have any threat. Usually it happens when you don't have any type of protection with you. So it, there are systems in Mexico which they're kind of like with that intention of protecting the journalists, but they're not quite effective enough because they don't have the full power of saying, okay, I'm, we're going to protect or you know, have this reporter with this amount of policemen outside of their house for the whole year. You know, it usually goes for a certain amount of time, and then it just goes, so, you know, like, hey, you don't have any threats anymore, we're just going to go, or we have other things to do, or it just goes... On, 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 in the sense of, um, it's not quite effective because they don't have the tools to manage it, and and I think it's something that reporters are trying to fight a little bit more to get that protection and to be constant. And you know, if I have protection here, I don't have to move to a, a different city. Self censorship, I think it's a little bit, at least with the reporters that I talk to, it, it's. Um, it decre I had decreased a little bit. They're more, more in the sense like we have to tell the story because if we don't do it, no one else is going to do it. So, yeah, and also, uh, oh, just want to add something to that. Um, the Mexican government, the federal and the state governments, used to control the press by giving them a lot of money, sometimes for formal advertisements, but a lot of times under the table to pay the editor and keep the editor happy. And you could always tell the reporters that were bought because they had really nice houses and cars that were way beyond you know their normal salaries. 
And the government has cut off all of that money. And most, the federal government cut it off, and the states, most states have cut it off because they're broke, a lot of them are broke. And um, without that kind of hold and that financial control of the media, the media has also become more critical because they have nothing to lose now. They used to stay quiet and do the official report because they wanted to keep the money that was coming in from the government. And so with the going, you know, the disappearing of those funds, they also have become more aggressive, I think. We had a question in the back. Uh, yes, there. I'll stand so you can see. Yeah, there we go. Um, what do we know about readership in in Mexico or other Latin American countries? Are, is there a growing audience for these independent news sites that are that are doing more and deeper reporting? Are the how are the traditional media outlets doing? I lived in Guatemala for a year and a half, a while ago, um, and I just. It seemed like news consumption wasn't a big part of the lives of the people that I was associating with. So do we know how far the news is reaching? They're having the same crisis in Mexico as they are in the United States, where there's huge loss of readership. There's huge financial difficulties in trying to keep um, media alive. Even the main, the big newspapers and the big media companies in Mexico City are really uh, struggling. Um, I would, the readership of these big newspapers, um, the traditional ones, have always been relatively small. And they were, as I said, completely propped up by, by government money. And that's how they survived for so long. So now that that source is pretty much gone, they're losing readership. They're in crisis, just like a lot of the media here. Um, and radio continues to be the main source of how people get their information, especially in the rural and outlying areas. And so there's more thought now to how do we get this information out via radio. I think social media, of course, makes a big, uh, big difference for traditional news outlets and, and new uh, independent reporters and independent media. But it's a double, double sword type of thing because, for example, in Tijuana, some of the concerns that the reporters had was that people are turning much more to social media, to random pages of of of, of people maybe showing uh, murders or people being, you know, bodies and things like that. And they sometimes trust more that type of sources than a reporter who has a radio show or, you know, does investigations. So it's kind of like a balance there where reporters are trying to find out what to do because there's less interest on reading a full newspaper with, you know, 2,000 words or something like that. It's just people are more interested in looking at videos on, on Facebook. So it's a challenge. Yeah, it's a challenge. Um, I'm sorry, we're officially the session has ended, um, but we're doing so well. I, I'd like to keep going if, if it's okay with everybody here. We have a question here, and then we're going to do this here, and then you, and then you. Okay, we're going to back, back and forth. Okay. Um, yeah, I just was curious, like, how much information we have on where uh, weapons are coming from with, like, the increased militarization of groups like Los Etas, and, um, yeah, just, like, organized crime in general, like having arms. I, I know a small store for a, a small portion of that came from like the ATF gun walking scandal. That was like one thing that happened. But like just in general, where did most of the arms like come from that are, or how much do we know, I guess, around that? From the United States. <laughs> and I do not know that. Um, <laughs> they, they come from the United States. Um, they're brought in various ways. Sometimes they're put on ships and shipped down farther. So a lot of them come across the border, but sometimes if, to avoid the border, they'll put them on ships and they'll go south and come in. Like in Veracruz, the state I wrote about, there's a big port there. Um, but yeah, and, and some will come from Europe, a smaller percentage, but it's it's entirely the, the United States and the loose gun laws in the United States that allow a, a lot of weapons to go down there. Thank you. Oh. No, no. Next year. She was. 
It's up to, there are various counts. I want to explain to people. Some people say 13, some people say more than 15. Those are various um, um, nonprofits that are counting, and they count based on whether they think the killing had to do with the journalist's work. And there's some differing in some of those cases. But the number that everyone's using right now pretty much is 15, in, and we're only in the end of October. That's a, a I, I think that biggest number before that was 12 or something like that. But imagine that, like in one year, 15. And a lot of people say that he is he is fomenting a lot of the danger because he basically says that reporters who don't agree with his agenda are the enemy. And he says that if you are criticizing me, you're with the opposition. And at one point when somebody the reporters regularly show up at his daily press conferences and talk about this issue and say, when are you going to protect us or this, tell them about individual cases. And, and one time he said that um, it's not an issue and the people who are making it an issue are my opponents. So he can only look at it in the context of what's favorable to him or unfavorable and not really, not look at it as a real problem. I also um, think it's, very interesting that he has a, a weekly show where he exposes reporters and the stories or lies they're telling. So when you go on national television and you talk about someone's personal life, how much they're earning, how much of what they're doing, what type of stories they're reporting, it, it, it not only discredits in the sense of the, the intention is to discredit the reporter and their work. So people itself, if, if you have that, oh, he's making this much money, he has these many houses, are not, it, it not only goes to one reporter specifically, it goes into affecting the, how people see, you know, see reporters. If you have a weekly show just dedicated on talking about reporters and, you know, and their stories, so. What, what else happens at this weekly, so this is what Vicente was telling me the other day, is that people will ask, what about the, the murders of lawyers and non-governmental organizations and various opponents uh, in one way or another? Um, and he'll talk about that. And he, sometimes he'll even raise, you know, well, we're investigating the case of this killing or that killing. But he has never mentioned the killings of the journalists as something worth investigating. And you know that's you know, part of society, vital part of society, and he doesn't see it that way. And, and Mexico also has a very high uh, percentage of impunity. Many reporters have been killed through the years, and there's no answer. Right. There's nothing, you know, there's no lead or, or any type of close case on what happened to, to reporters. That's a really important point because that allows the government to smear all of these reporters and say they're corrupt or they're taking money from narcos because there's no transparency in these cases and there are no investigations. And so you can't say, well, no, that's not true in, because of XX investigation. They don't exist. They hardly even do them. And then it makes it very easy, easy to broad brush the whole profession as corrupt. Yeah. You have a question here? Um, so it's been a while since I've been back to Mexico, but something that I would always hear, even in some places here in the U.S., it's like, for example, whenever I'd go to regions that were heavily narco-populated, like small pueblo-type areas, and when I'd be with family, they'd say, like, don't make eye contact, don't get involved in their business, like, don't ask, like, questions. Um, and so that's how I'm curious, is, like, how do these reporters go and, like, find these sources that are willing to like answer their questions, like willing to like put themselves out there or like not rat them out for being like she's muscles, I guess. Um, I have a, 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 an example because it's very interesting. We re released a, a story this week about women journalism in Mexico and the reporter, one of them, she told me that she was before and this was about a story about women firefighters 
in Tijuana being harassed and being under very you know, bad conditions within the force in, in Tijuana. So she was telling me, like, before the, you know, one of the firefighters, FEMA firefighters, came to me to talk to me, they told me that they, they investigated me. <laughs> they, were, they were, like, trying to see if she was trustworthy, she was, you know, uh, be, writing their story, you know, her stories. So before the source reached out to her to tell her, you know, this is what's going on in our workplace, she told me that for a few weeks and I think months she was being investigated or investigated by the firefighters before they came to her. I think also, so, so through the, her stories and reporting, uh, she got that trust from the source to tell them the story. So I think it was a really good example of how, you know, people who maybe mistrust or the, the reporter or, you know, the journalist can get trust while through your work. I, I think it was very interesting what, what she told me. I also think that because, as you pointed out, in those small pueblos, mm -hmm. everybody knows everybody. Yeah. So everybody knows who's doing what, and a lot of times they're their own family members or some distant relative. And so reporters really know everything that's going on. And I think they have to pick and choose who, who they like they might have a relationship with someone they grew up with who's now the fiscal or they'll have very important individual relationships that they can use to do that kind of reporting. Mm -hmm. But they also know the people not to ask or the people um, not to uh, disturb, so to speak, or let know that they're working on something like that. But it is very tricky because they're they're reporting where they live, and their families are there. And so not only are they taking a risk, but they're putting their families at risk. And I think, again, that leads to a lot of self-censorship, because they might want to do the story, but they don't want anyone else in their circle or their family to be mm -hmm. harmed. So it's typically local journalists that report like on those specific areas? Almost entirely, the reporters who are killed are local journalists. Um, I'm sorry, while we were told there's nothing supposed to follow us, I'm now being told there's a crowd waiting to get in. Uh, however, they're still going to have to wait one more second because there is a tradition within the international community. Every session ends with the same question. And I'm going to ask it each of you, and we're going to have to be short, I guess. <laughs> what does press freedom mean to you? So, Christina? Um, I think it's the ability to tell the story from a place. It's a difficult question. You should just have asked me before, so I get uh, I think it's the ability to, you know, to do the story and be able to talk about it and and make it personal. You know, it's a, telling the stories. It's about human beings. So I think it's important to to if we have the freedom of of telling that story, um, I think we just make it the difference. A free press to me is a free society. Because in order to have a free society, you have to have free thought. And uh, to paraphrase Salman Rushdie, he says, free societies are very messy. And the process of having uh, free thought is, is conflictive and messy. But that's eventually how we come to a consensus on who and what we want to be. And if you, if you don't have the information to make those decisions, you, you don't have a free society. Um, Pastor and Christina, thank you very, very much. And this was a fascinating discussion. We, we really couldn't have gone on much longer, but that doesn't mean crowd out there. Um, we're